first four guys in the draft this year, those guys have all been to our camps, and you're starting to see that be kind of the common theme. Um, you know, this year at the Elite 11 Finals, um, you know, Drew Locke was a counselor, Ch- uh, Trace McSorley, um, Tua Tagovailoa, Jalen Hurts, um, you know, uh, Milton at UCF. Um, and so we've just had, you get to see the yeah. very best. And so that's the thing that's really cool as a coach, too, is um, when you challenge your players, you know, as a coach, you're challenging your players to kind of reach their potential and push their comfortable and get out of their comfort zone. Um, when you have days where you spend days like that at the court in the quarterback space with guys like that, it pushes you to yeah. get out of your comfort yep. zone as a coach. Um, yeah. And so that's been a really cool experience for me, and it's been something that's really helped me grow, and that's kind of something now that I think back on it. Um, uh, that's probably as much as I'm thankful for when it comes to the quarterback space is the opportunity to um, not just be around it, but to be – super involved to where you're seeing those guys, um, you know, a couple times a year, um, and you're getting to see those guys really turn into superstars and then eventually first-round picks. Yeah, so, you know, last year watched the national championship game, you know, when when Alabama's bringing in this true freshman off the bench, you know, I'm going, ah, who's this guy? You know, I don't know, but you had seen him at Elite 11, right? And he, he did a pretty good job out there, didn't he? Well, and he absolutely, and the coolest thing was is the – the group text at halftime of the national championship game um, was was pretty rad. I mean, we're saying here it comes, and Georgia won't know um, what to expect. And I mean, the throw that he made that we all remember um, to win the game. Um, nobody in his class at that year of the Elite Eleven made that throw better than him ever. I mean, he was that. Like, that's his money throw. That's his best pitch, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, like, when you saw it, you're like, nobody does this better. Like, move the safety, tight reset back to it, yeah. and throws a strike. And you're like, you kind of knew it was coming. Um, and he's one of those kids that's special from a talent standpoint, but he's also, ta- like, so special from the neck up to where um, you see more – um, I, I think some of the interviews that you've that he's had since then, he's kind of like, yeah, it was really just another game. You know, it was just mm-hmm. another opportunity to go play. And, and I know that kind of sounds like, yeah, easy for you to say now, but that's really how he approaches it. And so I think that's why some guys are more successful than others um, when the talent level is the same, but what you have between your ears and the way that you can slow your mind down and let your body take over um, – you know, and you're not thinking anymore. You're just reacting. Those are the guys that become special, and obviously, special moments turn into special players. I would say everything I've seen from him, as far as interviews or anything or body language or whatever, he's really impressive. And he's like a, a really impressive young man. Like, uh-huh. you know yeah. what? They got and they're. I thought Jalen Hurts was going to transfer, and he's he has it. They've been talking about that quarterback battle down there. I don't know. I, I think Saban's going to figure out a way to use both of them somehow. I though. think so, too. Um, and I think what Jalen's done, um, he's a coach's son. Um, he's a coach's kid. So he understands different. He understands it a little more in depth than maybe the average guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a huge credit to, and I know he said some things in the last couple of weeks, but I do think that there's just a little bit of like, uh, he probably is with his head spinning a little bit. Um, the one thing that he's done, um, which I think's, good advice and super impressive on his end is um he will graduate in december um i think that was important to him to go ahead and finish his degree at alabama and then that'll give him the opportunity to then become a grad transfer um and so i think it was like i'm gonna go battle this out and fight it and see what happens um you know sometimes in the sec if you don't have two quarterbacks you don't have any i know that's not the norm but i think sometimes you think like you just never know with the with the way that league works um, and so I would imagine you're right. At some point, um, both of those guys are going to have to play key, key roles on that team. And yeah, you know, yeah. then at the end of the year, I think he can reassess. I think he knows that he's graduating. And um, if he needs to go grad transfer somewhere else, um, then he's put himself in that position to have that right. Yeah, I mean. See his little brother's going. Alabama, yeah, his so. little brother, yeah. Um, you know, and we know as coaches, like, when you have those position battles where you really – have those two guys that are very close in skill and do the right thing. It it just elevates not only that position but your whole team. 
Absolutely, no question. I mean, one of, the, and I'll just use a little story that um, this spring I had the opportunity to um, help Montel Cozart before the NFL draft. And um, so I ran the pro day, I ran his portion of the pro day at Boise State. And so I went a, day, a couple days early and um, one of the conversations, you know, he graduated from Kansas in May and didn't actually get to Boise until June and then played in the fall knowing that he was going into a locker room that already had a starting quarterback. And uh, Brian Harson, the head coach of Boise State, um, told me he said that Montel made it cool to compete in that locker room again. And even in six months, the impact that that kid had on that program will last so much longer than just the 2018 season. And so for a lot of the accolades and things that players receive, some of the coolest things are stories like that where you think, how much of a bigger compliment can a kid receive when his days are done than a coach say, man, this guy made it cool to compete in our locker room again, and he will make an impact on this program long after he's gone. I just thought that was pretty special. Yeah, was really cool. that, that is. Um, I actually I met him briefly uh, this last spring. He was out here on our field working when I was subbing one day, and I was just walking around, and you know, it was him and uh, a couple other quarterbacks, uh, Josh Freeman and then uh, Garrett uh, – Fugate, uh, working out, and you know, I mean, I just went up and talked to him, and uh, you know, he was just super down to earth, super nice guy. Uh, you know, I mean, some of those guys are very standoffish, and you know, are like leave me alone or this and that, you know. But I mean, when they were cleaning up, getting ready to go, I mean, he, you know, talked to me for a few minutes, and you know, it was just. I, I texted DJ, who you know, you know, coached him at, at Miege. I'm like, that's a good kid. I yeah. mean, that that's the kind of kid that you want to coach. And I think the thing is, is like, it's not an accident that he was successful on the field, and he's a great person. I think a lot of those things go hand in hand. I mean, yeah. your habits off the field create habits on the field, and vice versa. And so, mm-hmm. it's not surprising that he's been able to fight through some adversity, handle some tough situations, and still finish. You know. Um, his dream was to play professional football, and um, he's he's living the dream right now. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, I just don't think those things happen by accident. Yeah, so, I mean, that's just a great, you know, testament to him and, you know, him being a great guy. And So uh, we are down to single digits now for college football kickoff. Uh, I know I'm pretty excited about that. We were talking the other day. You're pretty excited about that. Um, so who are uh, – you know, who are some of your teams to watch you think that could get in the playoff? Well, say, uh, who's, who's your team? Yeah. You know, or my, do you have a favorite team? I do. I'm a Missouri Tiger fan. Oh, yeah. Okay. There we go. Um, you know, um, <laughs> and really growing up in southwest Missouri, I mean, even when they weren't good, I can remember, you know, the days of sitting on the hill for eight bucks watching them get beat, you know, yeah. but still being there. Um, and, um, and then, you know, as, time's, as time has gone on with different guys, um, you know, that I've had the opportunity to coach or um, be around and uh, being more attracted to that, um, you know, to that program um, has made me even a bigger fan. And now, obviously, with Drew Locke being there, Dawson Downing, kid that played for us at Miege, um, who they just put on scholarship, um, which is really awesome and um, kind of a testament to the type of kid he is. It was unbelievable to me that he did not have the D1 offers coming out of high school. Yeah. Dawson Downing. I mean, I, I remember seeing film on him and just, like, it was unbelievable. Yeah, Sorry he, to cut you off. He, no, he was, a, he was a man yeah. um, for us for so long and um, really kind of was one of those guys that turned that offense into a different animal because of how much impact he had in the run game that allowed us to do more things in the pass game. And um, Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I agree with you there, but, yeah. Um, Missouri Tiger fan now favorites um, coming into the season I think it's probably the usual spe- usual suspects right I mean can yeah. Clemson figure out what they're doing at quarterback and can they get consistent play um, is it the freshman Trevor Lawrence or is it um, I'm blanking on his name Kelly um, you know which one of those guys whose team is it you know because they have enough enough guys around them if they can get consistent play at quarterback um, they're going to be hard to beat in the ACC. Um, you know, I think the SEC right now, um, you've got to go back with the guys that played in the national championship. I think uh-huh. Georgia yep. um, uh-huh. and Alabama are going to be 
um, you know, kind of the cream of the crop in that in in that conference. And then I think it'll be interesting out west. Um, I don't know if anybody is really set up, um, you know, to be a college football playoff team out there in the Pac-12. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the rankings right now. I don't know what's the who's the highest rated Pac-12 team. Yeah, I mean it's a good question. Yeah, the um, uh, Stanford's 13. Yeah, so. Washington's six. Yeah, I mean Washington's Washington, been good for you know, and a few years. I do remember having a conversation um, this off or this spring and summer um, with a friend of mine that works for the Pac-12 Network, and um, Yogi said it. He was like, "They're right there in the mix." I mean, you know. Um, now, does that mean partly because maybe? The, people might view the Pac-12 being down a little bit, so they're going to win the Pac-12, so by default they make it to the college football playoff. But, right. I mean, um, I, I, mean, I can see if, if Browning stays healthy and he can play consistent, um, you know, Chris Peterson does as good of a job as anybody in college football. There's not, you know, there's a lot of guys that take that jump from a non-Power 5 school that don't yeah. sign an extension at their mm-hmm. big job, um, and he's been able to do that and really take that thing over and even improve on, um, you know, improve on that program. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the when he was at Boise State, the Statue of Liberty play against Oklahoma is one yeah, of those things awesome. that just sticks out in my mind. You know, kind of like Vince Young, that final drive against USC. Uh, you know, just you've got everybody's got those moments that stick out, and that's one of them for me. You know, Chris. Chris Peterson beating Oklahoma Sooners and in a game that everybody was saying that Boise State shouldn't even have been in. Yeah. And then they come out and win the thing. And, you know, so, you know, good coaches can can make a difference there. And I'm glad to see him go f- jump to that power five and have that success. Absolutely. And I think it'll be really cool for college football if someone like that can sneak into, you know, if, if a Boise, um, you know, can sneak into – the college football playoff, and I think once Literally. it gets to eight, we'll see one. Yeah, but if would somebody really can like do to it. see UCF last year, yeah, man. I would yeah. really like to see that because they yeah. they, be, they beat Auburn and they beat him by she beat him by two touchdowns at least, right? Yeah, um, I, I, I got, watched that game like like a month ago, man. That Scott Frost is something else. Yeah, I, I got a good friend. Uh, you know, he's a big Alabama fan, but he you know he always says, well, that's Auburn's biggest game of the year. That's the only game they care about is beating Alabama. Whereas, you know, Alabama's playing and winning a national championship. You know, Auburn, he said their mentality is just they got to beat Alabama. <laughs> That's crap. Yeah. So, uh, and, I mean, you know, you you can say that. But, I mean, I, I don't know any coach in the country that literally just circles one game on their schedule and says, I don't no, care if we saying, go no. one and nine, we're going to win this one. You well, know? the only thing I would say that my only uh, argument to there would say – Jim Harbaugh might be doing that at Ohio uh, on Ohio State right now. That one <laughs> might be circled and say, "I better beat these guys or else." You yeah. Know? Um, but yeah, I know what you're saying for sure. I think that part, the Big Ten, is an interesting um, conference too. If you know, obviously Penn State um, with can they replace Barkley? Um, they lost their play caller. Um, now the head coach at Mississippi State. Yeah. And so a new play caller. Um, that security blanket that you have with a guy like um, Barkley, can they continue to move forward um, in, James, in James Franklin's tenure and get over the hump there and put themselves in it um, in, a, in a conference that you know probably only has a chance to get one? Yeah. Um, and so um, I think that that's a league that's interesting to me too. Because I mean, Wisconsin, you know, is one of those teams you got to talk about in the, in the top of that they're, league. They're ranked four. Uh, you know, I mean, and they've got uh, they've got their entire offensive line returning, which you know, I mean, you know, as a play caller, if you've got a great offensive line, the play calling is kind of secondary. Yeah, you know? I mean, you think about that Big Ten championship last year, and you know, it came down to essentially the final drive, mm-hmm. um, and kind of got to a point where Ohio State could pin their ears back and come at you, yeah. um, and they weren't able to convert. But it just shows you what a job that. Um, Paul Christ and that staff has been able to do at Wisconsin, and they're in that position really um, to be one of those teams that can get over, the, trying to get over the hump too. Penn mm-hmm. State, Wisconsin, in that conference, trying to kind of take on the big dog, um, yeah. you know, of Ohio State, and um, you know there there's some obvious you know controversy in, in yeah. Columbus right now, and so is this the year to one of those two get over the hump? Yeah. You know? 
I was going to say, we're, we were supposed to get to... Uh, I haven't seen it. We got any news on what's going uh, on? Th- they say that the investigation has concluded, and I th- I think I read something that they were going to do a press conference.